All right, hi everyone. I hope you are doing well. Congratulations on making it to this point in the semester. So this is the first lecture video for the last section of the class, section four. So today we're gonna to be talking about issues related to substance use. So we'll talk a little bit about substance use in general, the criteria for making a diagnosis. We'll also talk a little bit about issues related to specific substances as well. You will have an activity. Activity 10 will be discussed in the lecture video. Remember that activities need to be at least 200 words long and that I'm looking for your own original work. Another note here about activities is that there are 12 of them total throughout the semester and I'm going to keep your top 10 activities, which means that if you've gotten full credit for the first 10 activities, there's no reason as far as your grade is concerned to complete activities 11 and 12. So this week we have 10. If you're happy with the activity points that you have after activity 10, then you could skip 11 and 12 and use those as your drop grade. You don't need to tell me that you're going to do that. Uh, at the end of the semester, I'm just gonna drop your two lowest activities. Even if you uh, don't let me know, I'm just gonna drop the two lowest ones. So you don't have to email me. Uh, you can of course email me if you have questions. But if you have missed uh, some earlier activities or if you've not gotten full credit on earlier activities, then I do recommend doing activities 11 and 12 as well to earn some of those points back. So let me know if you have any questions about your grade or about the material. I'm going to go ahead and get into lecture. All right, so as I said, today's lecture is going to be talking about substance use. So a couple of notes before we actually get into lecture. This is very important information for you guys to understand. If you are going to be working with people in any capacity, but especially if you're going to be maybe a clinician working with a client, you are going to have individuals who struggle with substance use. But it's also especially relevant to your particular demographic. So. A lot of the research suggests that some of the heaviest periods of drug use happen during what we would traditionally think of as the college years, the 18 to 25 kind of thing. So today's lecture information is relevant for a wide variety of reasons for you guys. So first of all, when we're talking about substance use disorders, we have to talk about what do we mean when we say substance. Now there are different definitions of a substance or a drug. Some individuals would define a drug as just anything that impacts your mind or your body. Now that's a more general definition. That kind of definition would leave the door open for something like, for example, food to be considered a drug. So if you eat chocolate and it changes your mood, does that make chocolate a drug? Well, we could debate that. Uh, the definition that your textbook uses refers to it as any substance other than food that affects our bodies and minds. So excluding chocolate today. Current language uses the term substance rather than drug, although you will hear me use those two terms kind of interchangeably. Really we're meaning the same thing. The reason why we might favor the term substance is that when a person hears the word drug, they probably assume that it means an illicit drug or a prescription drug. Things that can be gotten over the counter might not be considered drugs, but over the counter medications or alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, these would still be considered substances. So bearing that particular definition in mind, about 9% of all teens and adults display substance abuse or dependence. We're going to talk about what that means in just a second. One thing to note about this, it talks about teens and adults. There is some controversy over at what age we should actually start including individuals in our substance use research. So a lot of research studies start at maybe age 12 or even age 11 or 10. So there are some concerns over whether we can get valid information, uh, the ethics of asking 10-year-olds about drug use, that kind of thing. But we do know that drug use happens and can start happening at early ages. All right, now when we're talking about a substance use disorder, we're talking about an individual who is using a substance in a way that is causing impairment or distress. So first of all, this is the diagnosis in the DSM-5. So you would be diagnosed with a substance use disorder and then 
when you give a specific diagnosis, you would list which substances, or just one substance depending on the situation, a person is having problems with. Now, the reason why we use this term substance use disorder, as I said, is to try to make sure that people understand that there can be things that we consider, um, maybe things that we don't think of as being addictive or things that we don't think of as being serious that can still cause a substance use disorder. So caffeine could still technically be a substance use disorder. So when you're looking at the criteria here, it says the presence of at least two of the following symptoms. So what you'll see is there's a long list of symptoms here. You only have to have two of the symptoms in order to receive the diagnosis. But bear in mind that with the DSM-5, not only are we listing the specific diagnosis, we're also including how severe the diagnosis is. So a person who only has two of these symptoms would be maybe diagnosed with a mild substance use disorder. And then the more of these uh, symptoms that a person has, then the more severe we would consider it. So we'll go through and talk about in a second what we mean by things like tolerance and withdrawal. But basically we're seeing a person who is using large amounts of a substance, having a difficult time stopping the use of that substance putting a lot of time, effort, and money into getting the substance or recovering from the effects of the substance and maybe starting to have some relationship problems, work problems, other social issues because of a substance use. So remember our D's here. So we talk about distress and dysfunction and danger and deviance. Now, of course, deviance is a tricky one because deviance has to do with social norms and different people have different ideas about what is appropriate uh, substance use behavior. So on those list of symptoms that you saw just a second ago, tolerance and withdrawal are listed. So these are some symptoms that we see oftentimes in individuals who have substance use disorder. So if you're starting to ask yourself the question, am I getting too dependent on a particular substance, this would be a couple of the things you might look at. Uh, first of all, tolerance. The basic idea behind tolerance is that the more you use a substance, the more used to it your body becomes. So when, for example, a person first starts drinking alcohol, their body is not used to the alcohol. And so because of that, they might have a large effect from the alcohol. But if you use alcohol in relatively large amounts over a certain period of time, your body gets used to having that alcohol and it starts functioning better under the influence of alcohol perhaps just because your body starts adjusting to it. So for example, your system might start to metabolize a drug more quickly, gets it out of your system because it's used to dealing with that substance. Or perhaps your brain might sprout extra receptors because of the use of the substance. If the substance releases some feel-good neurotransmitters, and your brain is saying, oh, well, we don't have enough dopamine receptors here. It might sprout new receptors. So tolerance happens when your body gets used to the drug. And because of that, you ne then need a larger dose to achieve the same effect you had earlier. So a person who's never consumed alcohol might get a buzz off of one beer. Whereas if that person continues to drink on a regular basis, it will take more and more alcohol for that person to start to feel anything again. Now, you can see how this could lead to a substance use disorder. If you have to start using larger and larger amounts of the drug and spending more and more time, effort, and energy getting the drug to be able to experience what you originally felt. So tolerance contributes to the cycle of addiction, but withdrawal does as well. So withdrawal, our definition here, unpleasant, sometimes dangerous reactions that occur when a person stops taking a drug that they have been using on a fairly regular basis. So for example, if a person has been using alcohol on a fairly regular basis and they stop using alcohol, as I said, your body has gotten used to having alcohol. It's gotten used to functioning under the influence of alcohol. So that then when you stop using the substance, your body has to learn how to function without it again. And this is when the withdrawal symptoms can come up. Now, one thing to note, I don't know if this is explicitly stated on the slides, but one thing to note is that withdrawal symptoms are usually the opposite of the effect of the drug. So if a drug made you feel relaxed and calm and helped you sleep, then when you withdraw from that drug, you'll feel jittery. You might feel anxious. You might have trouble going to sleep or staying asleep. 
So you can also see how withdrawal could contribute to addiction. If you stop using a drug and you start having painful withdrawal symptoms, then that leads a person to want to go back to the drug, but then because of tolerance, they may have to use larger and larger amounts. So kind of a, a cycle here that can create or worsen addiction. Now we're going to be talking about a few different types of drugs today. This is by no means a comprehensive class. We're just going to hit the high points on some of the drugs that are used and abused most often. We're going to start off talking about the class of drugs called depressants. Now just like this sounds, depressants work by slowing down the central nervous system. So remember we talked about the pattern of neuronal firing, about how messages are passed from neuron to neuron. Well, drugs often have their impact on those neurons, on the way that they fire, and on the neurotransmitters that are released into the synapse. So depressants are all classed together because they have a similar effect of slowing down that neuronal firing. Now when you slow down a person's central nervous system, that person will then feel relaxed, maybe feel calm. But also, because of that, a person may not be able to react as quickly, so we're going to see changes in reaction time, uh, motor ability, judgment and concentration, so we'll see changes in the way a person thinks when they're under the influence of a depressant. Now, there are many different types of depressants, but we're going to talk about three of the most common, alcohol, sedative hypnotic drugs, and opioids. I'm just going to very briefly touch on these. So when we're talking about alcohol, um, this is probably one of the better known substances, certainly by college students. So what you, um, you might be surprised at some of the numbers. Uh, I have seen research studies that suggest that in the last two weeks, at any given time, in the last two weeks, 50% of college students have had at least one binge drinking episode. So alcohol is something that we are aware of. One issue with alcohol is that if you are over the age of 21, it is legal and relatively easy to obtain. And so sometimes we have um, some preconceived notions about how dangerous a drug is depending on how easy it is to get our hands on it. Because alcohol is something that's pretty easy to, to get, people oftentimes misunderstand that it can be very, very dangerous. So. Keep in mind, as I go through today's lecture, I'm trying to provide you guys with good information that you can use, uh, but also bear in mind that I am not your mother, but I am somebody's mother, so don't do drugs, okay? I'm probably going to say don't do drugs about 45 times. You guys just bear with me, please. All right. Alcoholic beverages contain ethyl alcohol. Now, as I go through and talk about these substances, I will briefly touch on um, how these drugs get into your system and why that matters. So alcohol is pretty much always drink and it gets into your system uh, through your digestive system. Now one thing about consuming a substance, getting a substance in through your digestive system, is that it takes longer than it does other methods of getting a substance in. So kind of reviewing a little biology here, your digestive system, so something goes in your mouth, down your esophagus, to your stomach, and then small intestine, large intestine, you got it. So the idea is that your alcohol has to go through your digestive system before it can get into your bloodstream. So it does take a while compared to something like, for example, um, injecting something into a vein or um, sniffing something, huffing something, those things would get in very quickly. Alcohol takes longer to get into your system and because it has to go through your digestive system, there are some varied results depending on, for example, what other substances are in your stomach at that time. So you might feel more of an effect from alcohol if you have an empty stomach, that kind of thing. Now. The fact that it takes longer to get into your system is a negative if you're thinking about the fact that it takes longer and you may not get as much of the effect. But it's also a positive because if a person consumes too much alcohol, there is a natural bodily reaction of vomiting that can then rid your body of some of that alcohol. Whereas if you were to inject something into a vein, there's really no way to get it back at that point. So having said that, you take the alcohol in, it's absorbed through your stomach lining into your bloodstream, impacting the central nervous system from there. 
Now, alcohol is going to block messages. It's going to slow things down. It increases the effect of GABA, and GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So it increases the impact of a neurotransmitter that slows things down. So the net result is that your central nervous system will not work as quickly. Now, what you actually feel from alcohol is determined by several different things, some of which are genetic, some of which are environmental. It may have something to do with how much experience that you have with drinking alcohol, what kind of alcohol, what else is in your stomach, that kind of thing. But also, your body type has something to do with it. So, you're going to have more of an effect from alcohol if you have a larger concentration of the alcohol in your blood. You might hear the blood alcohol concentration. So then, your body type matters here. A person who is larger, who has more blood in his or her system, would then be less impacted by alcohol than a smaller person that had less blood in his or her system. But gender also matters, and part of that has to do with what we just talked about. Part of it has to do with the difference between um, muscle and fat percentages, which are typically different between men and women, but also women have less of a certain enzyme, alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, the goal of alcohol dehydrogenase is to metabolize alcohol, to break it down. And because women have less of this enzyme, our bodies do not process alcohol as efficiently as men's bodies do. So then a woman would be more likely to become intoxicated because of the lack of that enzyme, or having less of the enzyme, I should say. So your blood alcohol concentration determines your experience here. What I want to say, though, is that you should be cautious with alcohol use. I know here I go again, don't do drugs. Because as a person uses alcohol more frequently, you may become tolerant to it in that you might not feel like you're intoxicated. But your blood does not become tolerant to it. So if you were to be pulled over and given a sobriety test, your blood alcohol concentration might be higher than you think. If you're a person who uses alcohol regularly, you may not be able to tell how high your blood alcohol level is. You may not have those symptoms, but it's still illegal to drive over the limit. So just something to bear in mind there. So your blood alcohol level at a lower level, 0.06, relaxation and comfort. Uh, as we get higher, we're talking about intoxication. So we're getting to that point where we are not safe to drive at all. Uh, and at a certain point, you can die from consuming too much alcohol. Basically, it depresses your nervous system too much. However, this is relatively rare for a person who is just drinking alcohol because you usually lose consciousness or uh, your body may vomit it back up. Your body works hard to try to protect itself from harmful substances. But we will have a couple slides later in this lecture to talk about the danger of combining drugs. Combining alcohol with another drug might get you to that higher concentration a little bit sooner. So I'd be especially cautious with that, but we'll come back to that in a second. One thing about alcohol is that it is metabolized by your liver, and there is nothing you can do to increase the speed of this process. There are all kinds of uh, old wives' tales and myths about how you can sober up more quickly, but they're not actually really helpful at all. The average rate of metabolism is about a quarter of an ounce per hour, and there's no way for you to speed that up. So it doesn't matter what you eat. Eating carbohydrates after drinking alcohol does not get it out of your system faster. Uh, sleeping does not get it out of your system faster, and this is something to know. If you've consumed a lot of alcohol, you might lay down, take a nap, and wake up and think that you're sober, and you're not, because it takes time for your body to get alcohol out of its system and there's not really anything you can do to increase this process. Also, caffeine does not increase this process. So there is a notion, an idea, that you can combine alcohol with high levels of caffeine and the caffeine will then fend off the effects of the alcohol. That does not actually happen. So I know there, there are some drinks that you can get that are a combination of energy drinks and, and alcohol. It's actually probably more dangerous to do that because when you've had the energy drink component, it might make you feel like you're more sober than you truly are, but it doesn't actually decrease the effects of the alcohol. So be cautious. So when we're diagnosing alcohol use disorder, we're going to look at those symptoms that I showed you guys earlier, that list of criteria. 
Typically, what we see is that people start abusing alcohol oftentimes because it helps them in some way. So perhaps a person is anxious, or perhaps a person is depressed, or they're experiencing other psychological problems, and the person might be self-medicating with alcohol. One thing that we sometimes see is that people who have social anxiety might use alcohol to try to reduce that when they're in social settings. A couple of thoughts on that. Um, I don't know if you guys watch The Big Bang Theory, and I haven't followed it in a while, uh, but I'm pretty sure this is what was going on with Raj. So Raj had a condition where he couldn't talk to women and, unless he was under the influence of alcohol. But if you watch that show and you listen to the things he said to women while he was under the influence of alcohol, you would think he would have been better just not drinking and not talking to women. Uh, so alcohol can have a very negative impact on your social behavior. Uh, but individual patterns are going to vary. This is why it can be tricky to diagnose uh, because some individuals can consume very large amounts of alcohol and seemingly still be having it, you know, have their whole life together, don't show a lot of distress or dysfunction, whereas some individuals might start to have distress and dysfunction at a lower amount. So it's obviously tricky to diagnose here. Uh, what we see is that alcohol does tend to follow some of those patterns I was talking about earlier with tolerance and withdrawal. So once you start drinking alcohol, your body gets used to it, and so because of that, you have to drink more and more alcohol to feel the same effects. At the same time, the more alcohol you consume, the stronger the withdrawal symptoms. Now, if alcohol calms you down and depresses the central nervous system, then when you're withdrawing from alcohol, you will feel anxious, you will feel jittery. People often experience nausea, vomiting, uh, difficulty sleeping. Now, what we do see here is that alcohol, despite the fact that it is legal and not terribly regulated once you're over the age of 21, alcohol is actually one of the most dangerous drugs to withdraw from because there is the possibility of a withdrawal syndrome known as delirium tremens. You might hear this coined as the DTs. The basic idea is that alcohol suppresses your central nervous system when you stop drinking alcohol, using alcohol, you have a rebound effect where your central nervous system might start firing excessively. And this is where a person can have seizures and can potentially die. So if a person has a very serious alcohol problem, then the safest place for them to go through treatment and to go through their withdrawals would be in a medical facility where they can be closely monitored and given medications to try to prevent other problems. Now, we know that there are both personal and societal issues related to alcohol. So alcohol plays a role in suicides, homicides, assaults, rapes, accidents. A couple of things to say here. One is that we talked about the relationship in our lecture on issues related to suicide, about the relationship between suicide and alcohol use, and about how individuals who engage in a suicide attempt often do so under the influence of alcohol. We're also aware that accidents happen, people get into car accidents and, and other kinds of accidents under the influence. What I will say is that both the individual who is perpetrating a crime as well as the victim of a crime, there may be correlation there with alcohol. That does not make it okay, um, briefly, because I, don't, I have a lot of material to cover in this video. Uh, it is never okay to take advantage of another person. It is never okay to assault another person. There is never a situation in which a victim brings it on him or herself or warrants this. So sometimes though we have this way of thinking where if a person is a victim of a crime and they're under the influence then we say well that person shouldn't have done that and they played a role in the... No. Be cautious with that kind of thinking. That kind of thinking happens because we try to use that logic to make us feel better. Like, okay, if there was something the victim did that caused it, then I can make sure it doesn't happen to me and to the people that I love. That's the reason we do that, it's defensive. The problem is then we take the blame off of the person who deserves it, which is the perpetrator. And then the perpetrator feels like they didn't do anything wrong. So let's be very cautious in the way we talk about these issues. Obviously, excessive drinking long-term can damage physical health. One thing that we see is that individuals who use alcohol heavily oftentimes neglect other aspects of their health. 
So things like diet issues, nutritional problems here can cause other substantial health problems as well. We know that alcohol can damage the liver, can damage the brain, so be very cautious. One thing that I cannot stress enough is that it is dangerous for a woman to consume alcohol during pregnancy. Now, this is a very hotly debated topic among many. We Think about the way we do research, typically. We bring in groups of people, we randomly put them into different groups, we randomly give them different conditions, and then we measure the outcomes. Well, you can't do that with pregnant women. We can't bring in a group of pregnant women and give some of them alcohol and give no alcohol to the others and see if we do damage. That's wildly unethical. But because we can't do that research, which I'm not advocating for, we can't do that research, but because we can't do that research, there is no way to define at what point alcohol becomes dangerous. The only way we can do this research is correlational. If we have a woman who used alcohol during pregnancy and then we look at her outcomes, that's correlational. I understand that there are a lot of individuals who feel like this is okay for them to consume alcohol while pregnant or while breastfeeding, but our research suggests that there can be some very negative outcomes here. Fetal alcohol syndrome is a disorder that is on a spectrum and so there are some individuals who have very mild symptoms and some who have very severe but there's often a combination of physical health issues as well as mental issues in the child so this can cause intellectual disability, learning disabilities, all of the developmental delays are associated here. So what you're going to hear from me and what you need to answer on my test to get the points is that there is no amount of alcohol that is safe during pregnancy or during breastfeeding. The absolute best practice is to abstain completely. All right, I feel very strongly about that, so there you go. All right, moving on, uh, another class of depressants, opioids. With opioids, we can have both natural opioids that come from plants versus synthetic opioids that are made in a lab. They are called narcotics, basically. Now, some of the natural ones that you might be aware of, opium, heroin, morphine, codeine, and the best well-known uh, synthetic opioid would be methadone. Now, these drugs vary in their potency. So a drug like heroin, for example, is extremely potent, very addictive. It's not legal in this country at any level for any reason. In some countries, they have legalized heroin to be used for terminal patients, uh, like just trying to ease people out of this life with as little pain as possible, but that's not legal in our country. On the other hand, something like codeine is relatively common. It's still an opioid, but it's much less potent. Uh, if you've ever taken Tylenol 3, then you've, you've had codeine. So these compounds, although they'll vary in their potency, they're all going to produce uh, strong depressant effects. Now, with the opioids, depending on the particular substance, there are several ways to get it into your system. So you can smoke them, you can inhale them, so huffing them. Uh, you can inject it under the skin, which would be not into a vein, just right up underneath the skin, uh, or direct it into your bloodstream mainline. Now, remember what I said earlier about the route of administration. Injecting something directly into your bloodstream is going to be the fastest way to get an effect, although inhaling is the second fastest. So there are a couple of very quick ways to get the substance into your body. On the one hand, that means that the person will experience this rush very quickly, which also makes it more addictive, more reinforcing. But this is also dangerous because there's really no way to get it out of a person's system once it is inside that person's system. So easy to overdose on. So injection is probably the most common use, as I said, because it's uh, one of the ways to get it in very quickly. Uh, the, inje the injection or whatever route of administration will bring on a rush. And so this person will have an immediate, very strong, positive feeling that will then be followed by several hours of pleasurable feelings. Now, the more you use the substance and the more your body gets used to it, probably the less of an effect you will have, and then you'll need more and more of the substance to be able to have that same effect, which is the tolerance in action. 
Now, these opioids also depress the central nervous system, just like alcohol does, but they work in a little bit of a different way. Your body has natural painkillers called endorphins, and these endorphins are neurotransmitters that are there to help relieve pain. So sometimes when a person is in a terrible accident, they don't actually feel anything. Maybe a person has a horrifically broken leg. I don't know if you guys watch sports, but sometimes there are examples of people who have horrific injuries and in the moment may not feel anything. And then later on may have very severe injuries. But the fact is that the endorphins kick in and your body doesn't feel anything. Now, opioids mimic the effect of those endorphins. So they would bind to the same receptors, they would cause the same kinds of feelings that your natural uh, endorphins do. So they reduce pain, reduce anxiety or tension, but they can cause nausea, narrowing of the pupils, constipation. So sometimes you'll see commercials for drugs that will say they treat like opioid-induced constipation. So some individuals take opioids on a regular basis by prescription because of maybe chronic pain, something like that. And individuals who use opioids regularly uh, are especially at risk for some of the side effects, things like constipation. Now what I will say is that opioid use is on the rise. And actually, um, in almost all categories of substance use, men use more than women. But there's a difference here with over the, like not over the counter, but with prescription painkillers, like opioid prescription painkillers. Uh, the latest research I've seen is that women abuse those a little bit more than men do. But with every other substance, men use more. Now, what happens oftentimes is that a person might start off with an opioid painkiller. So the doctor prescribes the opioid for a short period of time to help a person while they're in recovery from an accident, that kind of thing. But because these drugs are very addictive, a person might start having some of those tolerance and withdrawal symptoms. And then when the prescription runs out and the person can't get them anymore and the withdrawal symptoms are so negative, that person may have to find other routes to, to get opioids. And this is where a person might switch to heroin. So heroin, as I said, is not legal for any purpose. It's not available by prescription, but heroin is an extremely strong opioid and usually people don't start with heroin. They often start with some of those prescription painkillers and then that ends up leading to a heroin addiction. So it doesn't take very long to become addicted to heroin. Uh, people start very quickly building a tolerance, needing more and more, and experiencing withdrawal symptoms. So once again, if this depresses the central nervous system, then your withdrawal symptoms would be an increase in your central nervous system firing, anxiety, restlessness, twitching, which could potentially be seizure-like, uh, pain, you can, you can, because opioids are a painkiller, withdrawing from them would create pain fever, vomiting, diarrhea, dehydration. Um, while an individual may not be as at risk for dying from an opioid overdose as they would be from an alcohol overdose, it probably feels like that's the result that's going to happen. It's very, very unpleasant. Now, what are the dangers of heroin? There are several different things. First of all, overdose is an immediate concern because people are using opioids in a way that bypasses your body's natural defense systems. If you inject this straight into your vein, there's nothing your body can do to fight it. Because of that, it is easy to overdose. The drug closes down your respiratory system and a person stops breathing and can go into a coma and can die. Now, if you get a person to the hospital fast enough, then there are medications they can give to try to cancel out the effects of the heroin and might be able to save that individual. But overdose is a very serious concern. Uh, also, people may not be aware of tolerance. People may not be aware of how dangerous, how easy it is to become addicted to these substances. And so people needing higher and higher amounts uh, may be more likely to overdose. But then also, the more you're using, the more risk you run of having uh, something impure in your drugs. So. Medications that are regulated by the FDA have certain requirements about what can and cannot be in them, and there are people who are checking up on that. If you get your drugs off the street, there is no one checking to make sure that your dealer didn't put something into the drugs. 
uh, oftentimes they put things in to reduce the cost. I mean, a pure opioid would be maybe too expensive. Maybe people wouldn't buy it. So if they mix in other things, then you can still have the addictive value here without them having to use as much of the drug. But you don't know what they're putting in there. Sometimes if, for example, if they're if it's a depressant, they may put in some over-the-counter depressant stuff. If, you're, if they're selling you a stimulant, they may put in over-the-counter stimulant things. But there could be other chemicals in there as well, and you're not aware of that. Also, because people tend to use needles to administer opioids, there's danger of spreading infections, uh, HIV, hepatitis, etc., etc. All right, switching gears to stimulants. Stimulants are substances that increase the activity of the central nervous system. So as contrasted with depressants, this is going to increase the rate of neuronal firing. So there'll be an increase in your blood pressure, heart rate, alertness, rapid behavior and thinking. Um, interestingly enough, an individual can still have some difficulty with concentrating in things with stimulants too, just like they can with depressants. So basically what I'm trying to tell you guys today is that drugs are dangerous and don't do drugs. I hope you guys have heard me say that a few times. Now, there are many different stimulants we could talk about. Four of the most common ones are cocaine, amphetamines, caffeine, and nicotine. So remember we're talking about substances, so we're including both legal and illegal substances. Cocaine is the most powerful natural stimulant known, and it produces its effect primarily through dopamine. Although it not only increases dopamine, it also increases norepinephrine and serotonin as well. But the biggest effect seems to be dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that uh, is implicated in some of the other disorders that we're going to be talking about, specifically um, psychotic disorders. We haven't talked about psychotic disorders yet, but psychotic disorders often happen when you have very high levels of dopamine. So basically when an individual uses cocaine, it produces a euphoric rush, but of course what goes up must come down. So at high doses, cocaine can produce intoxication where a person may look manic, a person may look like they're having psychotic symptoms. Obviously um, impaired judgment would be a concern with a high level of cocaine. As I said, this can mimic a psychotic disorder to the point that a person might be diagnosed with a cocaine-induced psychotic disorder because of the very high levels of dopamine, but we'll talk more about that when we talk about um, psychotic disorders. So if the upswing of using cocaine feels like this incredible high, full of energy, feeling good, then of course the withdrawal symptoms are going to be very depressing. And so we call this a crash. A person will have no energy. A person will have no motivation. A person may uh, experience difficulty uh, functioning because their body gets used to that cocaine, that, that high. Your body gets used to high levels of dopamine. So your body might sprout, your brain may sprout extra receptors for all the dopamine that you are unleashing on it. And then when you stop using cocaine, then those extra receptors just make the withdrawal symptoms worse. So what are the dangers of cocaine? Well, as with opioids, our first concern is overdose. Once you get cocaine into your system, it can be very difficult to uh, retrieve it. There are many different ways of using cocaine. People often uh, inject cocaine or like sniff huff cocaine, so that gets into your system very quickly. Overdose is dangerous. Excessive doses depress the brain's respiratory function. You can stop breathing. You can go into a coma. It can also cause heart failure. If you increase your blood pressure and your heart rate substantially, then you are going to be doing damage to your circulatory system. Also, as with pretty much all the substances that we're talking about, there are concerns with pregnant women. We do see that cocaine is especially dangerous during pregnancy. Uh, same little spill I gave earlier about alcohol also applies here. We can't do this research the way we typically do experimental research. We just have to look at correlations, but the correlations are pretty strong to indicate that um, there's an increased risk of miscarriage, of abnormalities. Um, if a mother is using a substance while pregnant, then the baby may have withdrawal symptoms after birth. 
So there are obviously a lot of things to consider, but um, when a woman is pregnant, that is not a time to be using substances. Speaking of substances, and why don't I just go ahead and address caffeine and pregnancy, because caffeine is very, very common. Um, there are risks associated with using excessive caffeine during pregnancy. So excessive use of caffeine is discouraged because in particular during the first trimester there's an increased risk of miscarriage. Now you are allowed to have, or the doctors do say it's safe to have a certain amount of caffeine. Uh, that what your doctor will tell you may be different from what another doctor would tell you. Um, caffeine, like for example in a Mellow Yellow, if you're talking about a 12 ounce Mellow Yellow, it usually has 50, 54, something like that milligrams of caffeine. Uh, usually people will say anything under 200 milligrams of caffeine a day is okay during pregnancy. So that would be maybe a couple cups of coffee or something less than that. Anything more than that though, you do increase your risk. So caffeine is the world's most wisely, widely used stimulant. It does not have an age specific restriction on it like alcohol or nicotine. So parents have to decide at what point they want their children to be exposed to caffeine. I'm personally trying to hold off on that as long as possible. My children have tasted chocolate, but none of the rest of these things. Uh, the most common form is coffee. That's how most people get it, but you can find some level of caffeine in tea, colas, or cokes, as we call them in the South, energy drinks, chocolate, over-the-counter medications, so a lot of over-the-counter pain medications, Midol, that kind of thing would include caffeine in it. Uh, caffeine is ingested, it's absorbed very quickly into your body and so it's something that our body metabolizes pretty quickly. Caffeine is a stimulant so it increases the firing in the central nervous system. It does produce a release of dopamine, serotonin, and norepinephrine just like cocaine does. The difference is that caffeine produces this at a much lower level. Now, if you have more than two to three cups in a sh of coffee in a short period of time, you can have what might be called caffeine intoxication. Part of that depends on how used to drinking coffee you are. Part of that depends on how strong you make your coffee. But there are times when a person might be having, you know, a little too much coffee and then start to wonder if they have a heart condition because their blood pressure is high or because their heart rate is high. Now, you can have an overdose of caffeine. You can cause seizures and respiratory failure. It is possible to die from an overdose of caffeine. But usually we have to have the levels you would find in about 100 cups of coffee. And I don't know that anyone would sit down and drink 100 cups of coffee back to back um, but just for the record, I don't recommend that. Now, what you may realize or not realize is that caffeine is associated with strong withdrawal symptoms. So caffeine is something that is used quite a bit by a lot of people. And because people who use it tend to use it habitually, you know, you drink your coffee every morning or, or however you get your caffeine if you do, people may not have experienced withdrawal. But I can assure you that while sometimes people think uh, they're not addicted to a substance. If you stop using it, you may find out otherwise. My brother and I had a bet at one point in time, this was my freshman year in college, I think, had a bet about who could go longer without caffeine, and I think I made it about 25 hours. Curled up on my dorm room bed, felt like I had the flu, I had to call and give up. I just couldn't do my homework. So. Uh, withdrawal symptoms, headaches, depression, anxiety, fatigue, so because we do use caffeine at a pretty regular level, it's advisable to ease yourself off of caffeine. So sometimes you can bypass withdrawal symptoms if you gradually reduce the, sub the use of the substance instead of doing it all at once. Now high levels of caffeine uh, may be correlated with heart rhythm issues, high cholesterol levels, high risk of heart attacks. This is individuals who use very high levels of caffeine. Also, as I said, it can be dangerous um, beyond a certain level during pregnancy because of an increased risk of miscarriage. All right, brief overview of substances today. Hallucinogens, cannabis, combinations. So hallucinogens would be a drug that impacts your sensory experiences. So things like LSD, for example. 
they can produce some psychotic-like symptoms. Uh, delusions really is where you believe something that has no real basis in reality. Hallucinations would occur when a person has some sensory experiences, but there was nothing in the environment to cause it, like seeing something that's not really there, or hearing something that's not really there. So hallucinogens can produce um, some odd experiences. Uh, but that's all we have time to say about uh, that for this particular lecture. We are going to talk a little bit more about cannabis. So when we talk about cannabis, we're talking about marijuana. Uh, marijuana is extremely hard to classify because it does have some sensory impact like hallucinogens, but it also has some of the symptoms of depressants and some of the symptoms of stimulants. So it's very hard to classify. And we will also talk about, briefly, about combining substances. So when we talk about cannabis, as I said, we're talking about marijuana here primarily. These are drugs produced from a hemp plant. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to produce and use marijuana or cannabis, I should say. Uh, you can use the resin, which is like the substance that the plant produces to protect itself from the sun uh, on the outside. Or you can use a mixture of the different parts, the buds, leaves, flowering tops. But in either situation, the major active ingredient that causes the symptoms is THC, tetrahydrocannabinol say that three times fast. Now the higher the THC content the more powerful the drug. And some of the effects that you may experience if an individual does uh, use marijuana would be a mixture of hallucinogenic depressant and stimulant effects. So as I said it's very difficult to classify marijuana because it does a little bit of everything. So at low doses, the user typically feels joy and relaxation, usually feeling some of those maybe depressant effects of being calm. However, you may also have some effects that you might think of as being stimulant related, things like anxiety or maybe irritation. The person may have some cognitive symptoms like feeling suspicious, that kind of thing. And so technically what we're saying here is that if a person is Experiencing these symptoms, this is cannabis intoxication, so the person is intoxicated on the marijuana. Now, at higher doses, cannabis does produce some hallucinogenic effects, maybe somewhat similar to what you might see with something like LSD. So you might have some odd visual experiences, changes in body image or your perception of, of your body, and hallucinations. So. As you're looking at this, one of the things to be keeping in mind when we talk about a drug, how would it impact a person's ability to function? So you can imagine that a person who, first of all, is having depressant effects, so probably having an impact on that person's reaction time, in combination with the fact that the person may be suspicious, may have some uh, strange patterns of thinking, combined with some odd visual experiences, I would definitely say that it would be a bad idea for this person to operate heavy machinery. Now, most of the effects typically last two to six hours, although symptoms can kind of hang around for a little while after that. It depends a little bit about the tolerance, about how much of the substance you've used, how strong that substance is. Now, one interesting thing about cannabis or about THC is that it can build up in your system and be stored in body fat. And so sometimes we can see these symptoms lingering a little bit longer than they would with other substances. Now, previously we have thought of marijuana as a drug that did not cause dependence or a person, basically if you're dependent on it, it's really hard for you to function without the substance, whether that be a psychological dependence or a physical dependence, it changes your functioning. So previously we did not think this about marijuana. However, we do see that there is a risk of dependence with marijuana. Some of our research suggests that the, the way that an individual becomes dependent on marijuana is a little bit different than other substances and may be more psychological in nature. So. I give the example, I had a client once tell me that um, this person didn't feel like they could be around other people if they hadn't had marijuana. Like this was basically the only way they could tolerate being around other people. So you can become psychologically dependent on it where it's very difficult for a person to be without the substance. Now, 
One thing that we see is that this increase in abuse and dependence may be because the drug itself is changing a little bit, at least the way that it is sold. Basically what we're saying is that the marijuana available today is more potent than the drug was back in the day when people used to use it. So the marijuana that you guys deny smoking uh, is a little bit stronger than the marijuana your parents denied smoking. Now, when we're talking about marijuana, there's always a legal conversation here as well. So as you guys may be aware, there are certain states where it is legal to use marijuana. There are different ideas about marijuana, uh, about whether it could be used for medical purposes, so something that requires a prescription, or whether it could be used recreationally with some kind of restriction on it, taxing on it, that kind of thing. Uh, in Mississippi, uh, at the moment, marijuana is um, not legal. Um, there's a lot of debate over this issue, and I have heard from students on both sides. Uh, one of the arguments that I hear most frequently is that marijuana seems to be less dangerous than alcohol, and yet alcohol is legalized, which my response to that would then be that I don't, that doesn't sound like an argument for legalizing marijuana. To me, that sounds like an argument for uh, getting rid of alcohol, but uh, don't worry, we've tried that in history, didn't historically turn out too well. I don't think anybody's going to ask me to be making the laws on marijuana or alcohol. Uh, once again, don't do drugs. All right, is marijuana dangerous? Well, a few different things to think about. The strength has increased, the number of people using the drug has increased, and so there are risks to be considered here. So the hallucinogenic uh, perspective here or the hallucinogenic effects of the drug can cause panic attacks, can cause um, maybe some severe anxiety if you have these very strange visual uh, hallucinations. Also because it does impact your ability to think, your ability to react quickly, and your sensory information, it has been implicated in accidents, so it is definitely dangerous to use marijuana and then drive, for example. It's also been linked to poor concentration and impaired memory. So if you guys watched that 70s show, it's been quite some time. I think Leo was his name. Uh, that was probably a, a dramatic uh, comedy version of what marijuana can do to a person's memory. But he never seemed to remember what he was doing up until that, that cup of coffee he was drinking. Uh, but as far as long-term use goes, in addition to the risk of dependence and accidents, it can also harm a person's physical health. Because marijuana is often smoked, it can be associated with some of the same things we see with nicotine. So it may cause respiratory problems, lung cancer. It also seems to have a negative impact on fertility, so it lowers the sperm count in men. And in women, it seems to impact ovulation. So there are some physical and psychological risks associated with marijuana use, yes. Now, briefly, of course, we don't have time to go over everything related to substances today, but briefly, things can get very interesting when you start combining different drugs. So when we're talking about combination of substances here, you may hear the term synergism, and you're going to see that on a slide in a second. But a synergistic effect basically means that taking two substances of the same class, the same type of substance, can substantially impact uh, the symptoms that a person has because of that substance. So we're going to be talking about synergistic effects. We're also going to touch on cross tolerance. Now, when I say cross tolerance, basically what I mean here is that if two substances are very similar to each other, you might be building up tolerance to one while you use the other. So, for example, if there is a person who has been abusing alcohol, then your body is building up a tolerance for alcohol. But alcohol is a depressant. So even if alcohol is the only kind of depressant you've ever used, because you've used alcohol excessively and for a long period of time, it may be that your body does not react normally to other depressants. So a person who has been abusing alcohol might then go in for surgery, having never had a surgery before, had never had anesthesia before, uh, and have a very unexpected reaction to the anesthesia because the substances in the anesthesia may be similar in some ways to the substances in the alcohol. So if two or more drugs are very similar in their actions on the, the brain and the body, 
then you can develop a tolerance for a substance you've never even used just because it's similar to a substance that you have used. Now that's a problem, obviously, um, if you're not aware of how your body is going to react to different substances. However, it could potentially be helpful. So one of the ways that this could be helpful is that if a person has been abusing a substance, then we could perhaps, while a person is recovering from that, give them a different substance that is less addictive, less dangerous, but has some of the same features, and this could with, uh, re reduce, excuse me, this could reduce the withdrawal symptoms. So, for example, uh, if a person has been using alcohol heavily, and we know that it is dangerous for a person to withdraw from alcohol because of that rebound central nervous system effects, then what we might do is give the individual a benzodiazepine, something like uh, Valium or Xanax, which has, in some ways, a similar effect on the brain, which could help the individual maybe reduce some of those withdrawal symptoms while they are detoxing from the alcohol use. Now, when I talk about synergistic effects or synergism, I'm basically saying that when you take drugs that have the same kinds of effects, they multiply each other's effects. It's not addition, it's multiplication. This is often what happens when you see uh, celebrities and others, it's just the celebrities or the well-known cases, of individuals who overdose on something like painkillers and alcohol. Because if a painkiller and an alcohol, they're both depressants, they have similar effects, when you take them together, it's not that you have the effect of the alcohol plus the effect of the painkiller, as you might imagine. Instead, it's more like you have the effect of the alcohol times the effect of the painkiller. It's multiplied. So you can very quickly overdose if you're using these substances together. So what I'm hoping you're hearing me say is don't do drugs. But if you do do drugs, and don't do drugs, but if you do, don't mix drugs. Don't mix drugs of the same class because they can produce an effect that you were not prepared for. One other little side note to just throw in here is that another thing that's very dangerous is to use a substance in a new location. So if you're a person who chronically has used a substance and you always use that substance in the same location, maybe with the same people in the same room at the same house or whatever, your body becomes aware of that so that when you go into that room and you sit down with those people your body starts combating the effect of the drug before you've even taken the drug remember your drug is your their body is trying to protect itself from the drug and so it will start fighting that drug before you even use it because of that a person might be able to use a large amount of a substance and not overdose because their body's working hard to fight it but imagine that that person then goes to a new location with new people and uses a drug there. Your body doesn't know that the drug is coming, and so your body does not start prepping early, and so therefore an individual might overdose. A dose that they could take in a familiar location might actually be a deadly dose uh, when they're in a new location. So once again, don't do drugs. But if you do drugs, and don't do drugs, but if you do, uh, do it in the same don't do it in new locations. I don't even want to tell you guys to do drugs in the same location. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying here, which is don't do drugs. All right, very good. Back to lecture. So what causes substance use disorders? Several different thoughts here. None of them seem to work on their own. You know, sometimes we feel like a cognitive perspective really does justice or a behavioral perspective is really enough. But when it comes to substance use, it's complicated. And so our best explanations here are going to be a combination of that biopsychosocial model, a combination of several different things that play a role in substance use. So starting off with a behavioral viewpoint, remember that behaviorism is based on conditioning. And operant conditioning is the idea about reinforcement and punishment. If you do a behavior and you're reinforced for it, you're more likely to do it again in the future. And if you do a behavior and you're punished for it, you're less likely to do it again in the future. So think about some of the substances that we've talked about during this lecture video. Imagine what that would feel like to take that substance. And then, for example, if you drink alcohol, and if the alcohol you drink reduces your anxiety, reduces your stress, makes you feel relaxed, and helps you sleep, all of those things are reinforcing, which then makes you more likely to use the substance again in the future. Then imagine that the alcohol wears off and a person is facing withdrawal symptoms. Now we're being punished for not drinking the alcohol. 
the longer you go without the alcohol, the more punishing it may seem. If a person is maybe craving that, that substance, the person is maybe having nausea, vomiting, headaches, uh, or even potentially seizures here. We're talking about how you're reinforced when you use the drug and you're punished when you stop. And so because of that, the drug is, is very easily, becomes you become addicted to it. Another thing to say is that it does matter about the method of ingestion. So as I said, something like an IV or injected straight into your bloodstream, because you get those effects much more quickly, they're much more reinforcing versus a delay. Like, for example, if you consume a substance and it has to go through your digestive system, there's a delay in the reinforcement there. So the reinforcement that is more powerful, like a stronger dose, or that is more quick, like uh, inhaling something or putting something straight into your bloodstream, those are going to be some of the things that are most addictive. Now, what about a biological view? You've probably heard people make arguments one way or the other about whether or not substance use is biological. Is it genetic? And oftentimes when we talk about this issue, alcohol is probably one of the ones people talk about the most. Is there evidence to suggest that a person might have a genetic predisposition towards alcohol abuse? Well, there does seem to be some evidence to suggest this. So first of all, if we're looking at the research in animals, we may find that animals, when they're given different choices of reinforcers, some animals may prefer alcohol, whereas some animals may be put off by alcohol. And we find that the animals that prefer alcohol tend to have offspring that also prefer alcohol. So, okay, it's potentially genetic in animals. So then what about humans? Well, keep in mind that we have ethics that control the way that we do research with humans. But one of the ways that we do this research has to do with twin studies. So, for example, imagine that you have twins and you look at maybe genetic, like almost genetically identical twins, those monozygotic twins, and you look at twins that are dizygotic or fraternal. And we might find that with twins who are almost genetically identical with those identical monozygotic twins, we might find that they actually are more similar to each other in their alcohol preferences than the fraternal twins that only share half of their DNA. In addition to that, we might also look at adoption studies. So what happens if we take children who have been adopted, so maybe their biological parents had alcohol issues, but they were adopted by biological parents who did not have alcohol issues. What we see is that the children who were born to parents who had alcohol issues and then adopted by couples that did not have alcohol issues were still more likely to use alcohol later in life even though they were not raised in the same environment as the parent that had a preference for alcohol. So on the one hand this does seem to suggest that there is a genetic predisposition. On the other hand I'm sure you know individuals who have family members who abuse substances and yet those individuals themselves do not. So this is not to say that just because a person might have a genetic predisposition that they will necessarily go on to develop a substance problem. There are many different things to consider there. The environment that they're in, the amount of stress that they're under. So go back to that diathesis stress model. You may have a genetic predisposition, but you may never actually develop the disorder if you're not under a certain type of stress. All right? So when we're talking about treatment for all the different disorders that we've talked about there there are many different things to keep in mind first of all we have to think about who gets to decide whether our treatment is a success or not and who gets to decide um, what our successes should look like so for example with substance use disorder should we be aiming for abstinence or should we be aiming for moderation? That's something that's difficult. So when it talks about how we have different criteria that are used, what happens if we take a person who was using a substance excessively and now they're only using that substance a little bit? Is that success? Some would say yes. Look at how much we've decreased. Look at the harm reduction there. On the other hand, some people would say no, the person is still using the substance and so they may increase their use of the substance later, may have a relapse, that kind of thing. So first of all, you have to talk to the client about what the client wants. Also, you have to consider legal ramifications, which is different from other disorders. So 
having a panic attack is not illegal, right? But using some of these substances we've talked about today is illegal. So you have to think about whether you're actually, if, you're, if your client is using an illegal substance in moderation, is that still okay? Because the client is still at risk for legal issues, that kind of thing. Now, it's also difficult to determine what treatment should look like because on the one hand, some people are able to stop using a substance without any intervention. So people may be especially uh, like scared or uncomfortable seeking out treatment for an illegal substance. So maybe they're concerned that they are going to go to prison if someone finds out about their substance use. Uh, on the other hand, there may just be some people who feel like they can take care of it themselves and perhaps with the right uh, social support, with the right help and changing some things in the environment. Some individuals stop using substances without any professional intervention. On the other hand, some individuals who go to treatment and receive professional help still have problems, can still have relapse, and some of them drop out of treatment. In fact, many of them drop out of treatment early, really before the treatment has had time to, to have an effect. And of course, you have to keep in mind that different substances are going to pose different problems. For example, alcohol is a substance that, despite the fact that it's illegal, it's still very dangerous to withdraw from alcohol. If you've been using it for a long period of time very heavily, you could potentially die. So if you have a client who is having alcohol problems, then you want to think about, are we going to be doing some inpatient treatment here? Are we going to need to prescribe medication? Because a psychologist cannot prescribe medication in almost every situation. There are a couple of states where psychologists can, um, can get certified to prescribe. But for the most part, a psychologist is not going to be able to prescribe medication. So maybe they need to see a psychiatrist or, or some other medical professional. Now, when we're talking about treatments that are behavioral in nature, there are several different ones. Um, one interesting behavioral treatment is called aversion therapy. Now, aversion therapy works on the principles of classical conditioning. When we talked briefly about classical conditioning before, we said it's all about learning associations, right? So the idea with a substance is that your client has learned a positive association with the drug they abuse. So, for example, if a person has been smoking cigarettes, your client has developed a positive feeling. It's, you know, maybe it gives them energy. It helps them stay awake. Maybe it helps them concentrate. And so your client has learned a positive association with nicotine. So your job then, with your client's consent, of course, is to help your client develop a negative association with the nicotine. And then that way, because of the negative association, maybe they will stop craving it. Now, one way I've heard uh, people doing this is someone doing something very unpleasant while they are using the drug. So, for example, I had a professor tell me once that she was trying to quit smoking. And what worked for her, she got a jar and she put some water in it and she put all of her leftover cigarette butts and things in it and like left it out in the sun and it was nasty it smelled putrid and awful and she would force herself to sit there and smell that jar while she was smoking every cigarette so that sooner or later she learned that association between that nasty smell and smoking cigarettes and that helped her not crave it anymore Another way we can do this is by actually pairing your substance with a drug that produces a negative effect. So this is sometimes done with alcohol. So for example, if you have a person who is abusing alcohol, that person has a positive association there. So I use alcohol, I feel relaxed, it helps me sleep, it reduces my stress or whatever. So what we want to do is teach the client to have a negative reaction to the alcohol. So one thing they'll do is they will pair drug-induced nausea with vomiting. So they will have the client take a pill, maybe Ipecac or something else, have a client take something that will induce nausea and then have them drink alcohol at the same time. Now, of course, if you take a pill that's going to induce nausea, you're going to get sick. And if you drink alcohol while you're doing this, you can kind of develop an aversion for it. If you guys have ever had food poisoning, maybe you understand what I mean about developing an aversion to something because you've associated it with vomiting. So one of the difficulties here, though, is that because this is an unpleasant process, clients are not always... Um, 
following through with this. They don't always comply. So if I'm someone who really enjoys alcohol and you expect me to take a medication on my own at home, take a medication that's going to make me throw up every time I drink alcohol, that doesn't sound pleasant to me. However, for a client that is very motivated, this can be really helpful. But another behavioral thing you could do would be simply reinforcing clients for going a certain amount of time without a substance. And so one of the ways we do this to make sure that they went without the substance would be to do a drug test to make sure that their system is free of the substance. And then we can set up some kind of reinforcement schedule where they're reinforced for success, which would be going a certain amount of time. And of course, you would gradually want to increase that time. If you set the goal too high at the very beginning, then they'll never get the reinforcement and it will never work. It may be all your client can do to go one day without the substance or even a few hours without the substance. But over time, you can increase the amount of time that they, uh, they go without the substance. You can also, if your client is willing to do this, include some punishment here. So, for example, I have heard of uh, psychologists having their client uh, write out a check to a like charity or something, maybe the campaign of someone that they don't like. And so if you end up turning in a urine specimen that has the substance in it, then we're going to donate your money to this political campaign you can't stand or whatever the case may be. And so that's punishing for the client. And sometimes that can be helpful. It just depends on the particular client's preferences. So in addition to some behavioral things, we might also include some cognitive therapy as well. Helping clients identify and change their thought patterns about use. So it may be something as simple as a person feeling like they don't have hope to change. Maybe they've tried to change on their own and it hasn't worked. And so having someone feel like it's impossible for them to change. So maybe just some education, maybe just some resources, um, some stories about how other people have changed uh, could be enough. Or maybe because your client is feeling helpless and, and hope, you know, they feel like they don't, don't have any hope, then maybe you can help them set some small goals in the very beginning. And when they start to feel just a little bit of success, that can change the way they think. That can help them be more hopeful for the future. Now, one thing that's important with all disorders but especially important with substance use disorders would be relapse prevention training. Relapse is basically a signal that the problem may be coming back. So we've started using the substance just a little bit uh, and we're not sure what to do. That's a very dangerous time. If you have a client who has gone several months without drinking and then your client has a beer and then your client starts thinking, okay, does this mean I'm a failure? Because if I'm a failure, I might as well go up and give up and drink the rest of the beer. So this is a time where we would say, when do we need to come back to therapy? What do we do if we find ourselves in this particular situation? Knowing that it's likely the client will end up in that situation at some point, helping them be prepared for that. All right, in addition, you might also use some biological treatments. So to try to help people um, stop using a substance, we can use, these are biological treatments because they're medications, because they work on the body, but they also do uh, have some things in common with behavioral treatments. Remember that a drug is reinforcing because of the positive effects of the drug. So we could give a client an antagonistic drug or a drug that blocks or changes the effects of the drug, and then the drug is no longer reinforcing. Um, I believe this is the way that Chantix works. You may have seen commercials for Chantix, a drug to help people stop smoking cigarettes. And they'll say on those commercials, you can continue to smoke for the first week while you're using Chantix. Well, they want you to continue to smoke for the first week because the way the drug works is to block that reinforcement. And so you can smoke all day long and it won't feel good anymore. And so because of that, because of this biological medication, you don't get reinforced anymore, and so there's no reason for you to use the drug. Um, these antagonistic drugs can also be helpful in helping if a person has uh, used too much of a substance. So if we're concerned that a person might be overdosing, uh, then getting the individual to the hospital, get them some drugs to help counteract the effects of the drug uh, to try to save a person's life. All right, now when we're talking about 
biological treatments, one of the ones that you might have heard of would be using a similar drug that is a little bit less dangerous and kind of substituting that for the drug that a person is addicted to. So for example, heroin. Heroin is a very dangerous drug, as we talked about, for many reasons. But one of the reasons why it's dangerous is the associated lifestyle. So a person is using needles that could spread infections. Also, this drug is very easy to overdose on, incredibly addictive. So methadone is a synthetic form that is less dangerous, but has some of the same effects as heroin. So an individual might go to a methadone maintenance clinic and be given a methadone. Now, a few things to say here. Because the methadone has a longer half-life, what that means basically is it stays in your system longer, but it takes longer for you to feel the effects. It's not that reinforcing. Methadone is not something you're going to be injecting. It's something you're probably going to be taking orally. And so you don't get the effect as quickly and it's not as strong. So you're not going to get high off of methadone probably. However, because it is similar in a lot of ways to heroin, it will help fend off the withdrawal symptoms. So a person who has been using heroin may be able to switch to methadone. They won't receive the reinforcement they were previously getting from the heroin, but they don't get the punishment that comes from having that withdrawal. So on the one hand, people would criticize this and would say, you were addicted to heroin and now you're addicted to methadone. All we did was switch the drug that you are addicted to. I would in some ways completely understand that, um, but I would say that if a person is not going to be able to quit heroin cold turkey, then methadone could be potentially a good option for many, for many reasons. One, because the methadone is given by professionals, and so it would not be dangerous to consume. We talked about how people can mix things in with drugs, and so that wouldn't be happening. Also, because we're not using needles, uh, we would not have that risk of spreading infections. And a person, because they're not getting the reinforcement anymore, uh, methadone may be a way for a person to kind of gradually get off of the substance. And so at some point, they may kind of wean themselves off the methadone as well. Is methadone dangerous to use during pregnancy? Yes, but it's not as dangerous to use during pregnancy as heroin. So just some things to keep in mind. All right, a lot of information during today's lecture. Here's your activity 10. I want you to be thinking about how substance use disorders are different from other psychological conditions and how are they similar to other psychological conditions. So thinking about ways that they're different, just a couple of things that come to mind for me. Uh, I think the way we view them in society is different. And so you could discuss something like that. I think the legal ramifications are different. And so you could discuss something like that. And yet, when you're thinking about what makes something a disorder, things like dysfunction and deviance and danger and distress, there are some similarities to some of the other uh, substance or some of the other diagnoses that we've already talked about. So I want you to be thinking for your activity 10 about how substance use disorders are similar to other conditions and how they are different from other conditions. All right, so that is the end of today's lecture. Please let me know if you have any questions about this material, if you have any questions about the activity. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys during our next lecture video.